Hey, family. Praise the Lord. This is Minister Presley. I'm so glad you decided to join the Abyssinian Baptist Church Virtue Sunday morning service here in Philly for the word of God that will resurrect your soul and convince, convict, and convert you because it's not what you have done. It's because of what Jesus has done for you at the cross. God bless you. Enjoy. It's time to be blessed. It's time to give. 
or we can do better than that. Uh, think about all that God has done for you. Uh, he protects you. He provides for you. And he even preserves you. Uh, the least we can do is worship him through our giving. Uh, this is all a part of our worship. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 and 7, it says that each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And even though we may not be at the church physically, we can still participate in our giving. Uh, we have four ways uh, that we give. Uh, our first way is that you can simply go to our website, uh, abyssinianbc.com uh, backslash give dash online. Our second option is that you can give through our uh, app Easy Tithe, which is found in your Play Store or your App Store on your smart devices. The third way is you can simply just drop off your offering uh, at Abyssinian Baptist Church. Our address is 4210 Germantown Avenue, and our stewards will handle your offering. Um, fourthly and lastly is we want to make sure that we can be a blessing to our pastor. Our pastor, Dr. Pointer, is not on a salary per se, but he's trusting God to touch the hearts of his people to bless him and his family. And he has two options. Um, one, you can simply give through Cash App. Uh, his handle is dollar sign point two four one. And you can also designate uh, your giving to pastor through your easy tithe as well. Um, we have a plethora of uh, ways to give. And we want to just personally thank everyone who has been giving already. We uh, ask God to continue to bless and keep you. And we also uh, want to thank God for those that will give as well. We also ask God to bless and keep you as well. Um, we thank you. God bless you and have a smile upon you. Amen. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. Uh, we continue to pray for God's mercy and grace for all of our loved ones, um, our family, uh, friends, as we weather this coronavirus pandemic storm. Um, as we continue to practice, and I, I hope that we're all doing this, we wanna continue to practice the distancing and the wearing of the face masks and the limiting of our activity and um, this quarantine. Um, everybody is on a lockdown, <laughs> we're shut in close quarters, and I know it's more than a notion. It's uh, trying to adjust and having to adjust. Uh, this quarantine is really bringing out the best and the worst in some of us. Amen. Uh, even if you're single, living alone or don't have, uh, don't live with a number of family members, it can cause a whole lot of anxiety. Um, it can become what we might as well acknowledge is cause us to be irritable. Amen. And, uh, you know, Irritation will set in when you're not able to do what you normally do. The shopping, the eating out. Uh, we just finished, uh, last week was Mother's Day and that in and of itself was a, uh, quite a chore or, or, or effort for some of us to try to uh, make as much of, as mo of Mother's Day as we could knowing that we couldn't do what we normally do. So as a church family and as members and those of you that are tuning in, we just want to ask that we continue to be prayerful. We're gonna to continue to seek God's face and to trust God throughout this whole ordeal, amen. Um, some of us, even as I speak, you're sick and tired of this, what they call it, cabin fever. Can I get a witness? And I believe the challenge of today's pandemic is not only medical or health-wise, it's also a spiritual challenge. And uh, in the past, these situations of pestilence and plague were interpreted, I'm talking in the past, as a kind of divine retribution. And there are people today who interpret the coronavirus as God's response to a sinful people. Now, while that may or may not be true, personally, this is just me thinking, and I think I'm right about it, I'm not sure if today's coronavirus pandemic is divine retribution from God. The, understand that uh, divine retribution is supernatural punishment of a person, 
a group of people or everyone uh, by a deity in response to some action. And I don't know if we're there just yet. I'm talking about divine retribution. But the world system and people who live by it are certainly placing themselves in a position deserving divine retribution. In other words, for those of us that have seen how in the past few years leading up to where we are today, it's been a certain decline in morality, a decline in seeking God's face. We're at a point where the Bible calls it, people want to do whatever's right in their own sight. And if that's not uh, making us or bringing us into a situation where uh, we, we, we are asking for divine retribution, I don't know what else will. But um, I do believe God will use this uh, coronavirus to teach you and I a lesson for our good and his glory. Uh, you remember Romans 8, 28, it says all things, including this, works together for our good and God's glory. Amen, somebody. In other words, I don't believe God is out to get us, so to speak, nor is he looking for a payback. But I believe God will use our disobedience and sinful ways to get our attention. Now, understand, it's not it's not wrong to see this crisis of health as a call to renew our relationship to God, because I believe it is as we are going through and shut in and shut down and restricted and all those kinds of things. You can't help yourself but. Uh, uh, God is speaking to us and sometimes God speaks, he, matter of fact, as a matter of fact, he speaks in different ways. God can speak to us through silence, just watching and looking at things as they develop and evolve around us. Amen, somebody. And I believe God wants to use this particular situation, this viral in, in infection, this, this time of pandemic anxiety to, to cause us to, uh, it's a wake up call for lack of a better word. In other words, what do you do? I'm asking a question. How do you handle your life issues? How do you keep yourself physically, spiritually, emotionally, or psychologically from blowing a fuse? I'm talking to you out there. Those of you that are looking right now, how do you handle this stuff? How are you dealing with it? Would you, would, would you say you're dealing with it in the best way possible? Perhaps that's true. How do you keep yourself from getting bent out of shape? How do you keep yourself from lashing out at people as a result of all of this? What do you do? I'm asking you, not the person next to you, not the person in the other room. What do you do? How are you handling this situation? I'm talking about when you're feeling restricted, blocked in, unable to move forward, weighed down with life circumstances. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Let's look at that. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, the New Living Translation. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us, don't miss this, strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run. I'm, lock, I'm looking at the Bible, y'all. It says, let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. I want to talk around the subject, the thought, irritability, a response to quarantine or cabin fear, fever. Let me, let, me, let me say that again. This message today is titled Irritability. A response to quarantine or cabin fever. I've already asked you how you're handling your quarantine. You need to understand this word irritable is a compound word that literally means to bring to a sharp point. It conveys the idea of being provoked or taking offense. The question I ask somebody, is there anybody that can relate to this quarantine causing friction or irritability in your house. I, I, I just want to know, is there anybody that would admit, be honest, tell the truth. As a result of us being shut in for such an extended amount or period of time, it's, it's, it's somebody said in our church, it's working your nerves. It's causing frustration. 
It's annoying you. Is there anybody out there would say, admit you're being uh, uh, annoyed, it's irritating, it's, it's causing a lot of friction. It's causing you not only to see outside of yourself, but even to understand and sense there's something going on in the inside, on the inside. See, irritability is something we all experience. Amen, somebody. But what sets irritability apart from other emotional uh, states is the extent to which it pollutes the emotional atmosphere around us. In other words, when you are <laughs> having a bad day, if you're not careful, you'll, 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 you'll exude that negative energy to people around you. Yes, you will. Somebody said irritability is the carbon monoxide of emotional pollutants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, one person's irritable mood can release negativity and stress-inducing energy that can negatively impact everybody else around you. Yeah, you can, you can sense when other people are irritated in the way they respond, in the way they look at you, in their body language. And this shut in, this, this shut, this quarantine uh, is not only bringing out the best, but it's bringing out perhaps even more so the worst in us. Can I get a witness? Now understand in the book of Hebrews, it addresses at least three separate groups. Y'all stay with me. I'm going somewhere. First of all, the believers in Christ, that's one group. Secondly, unbelievers who had knowledge of and an initial uh, intellectual acceptance of the facts of Christ. That was two. And then thirdly, this third group Hebrews looks or addresses is unbelievers who were attracted to Christ, but who ultimately rejected him. In other words, it's important, somebody, to understand which group is being addressed in this passage. Amen. Because you want to understand what does irritability have to do with this passage? Well, this passage is referring to believers in Christ. Amen, somebody. Notice here in this book, Hebrews, it was written to a church that was setting or settling into and becoming, listen, comfortable with the world system. Yeah, worldliness. Sometimes God allows storms to bring us back to a reality check. And Hebrews talks about or addresses the fact that a lot of people, I'm talking about so quote unquote God's people, were becoming comfortable with the people around. And I'm talking about people that were anti-God or people that were uh, uh, non-accepting of Christianity and losing their spiritual wartime mentality. Amen. And whenever that happens, whenever you lose focus, whenever you begin to uh, 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 drift away from uh, 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 commonality in Christ and the essence of, of, of serving Christ, it, 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 it causes you to lose your spiritual energy and your motivation to keep walking on the straight road, the pathway that God is pleased with. And if you're not careful, it becomes easier to meander in the crowd of life than to run the marathon. See, it's easier to blend in and you don't want to blend in. I don't want to blend in. And you know it and I know it. If the truth be told, <clears throat> prior to this pandemic, it seemed to be that people were getting comfortable. I ran the risk. I was running the risk of becoming comfortable with and satisfied with things the way they were going. And that's what happens. And you need to understand Hebrews, this passage on Hebrew, in Hebrews chapter 2 and chapter 3, the writer addressed the fact that we, you and I need to pay attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. And then it goes on to say, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So into the church, and that's what's happening, it has happened, has crept the disease of drifting and neglecting. And people are becoming and have become careless, spiritually lazy and negligent. That's the condition of the church. And that that is the background of Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, which says, y'all read it and I read it in the beginning. It says, let us also lay aside every encumbrance. Don't miss that word. And the sin which so easily entangles us. 
and let us run with endurance the race, listen, that is set before us. In other words, we're not here just to be here. God has a plan. God has purpose. God has a, 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 us right where we, he wants us to be. And we are to run a race. Again, let me ask. Do you think, just for a moment, God could be using this coronavirus quarantine to get your attention and mine? I'm talking about the drawing of the attention of the believer and those who will become believers as a wake up call to regroup, to refocus in spite of the obstacles or encumbrances in our way. You know what encumbrances are. I, I, I need not insult your intelligence, but just in case, encumbrances are things that hinder you or restrict you and I. And understand, this command does not come out of the blue, so to speak. That's the point of the whole book of Hebrews. It's talking about God calls us to endure, to persevere, to run, to fight, to be alert, to be strengthened. He says, don't drift, don't neglect, don't be sluggish, don't take your eternal security for granted. I don't know about you. But I'm so glad to know that I'm eternally secure. And with that security comes responsibility. Can I get a witness? The Bible says fight the fight of faith on the basis, listen, of Christ's death and resurrection. And show your faith the way the saints of Hebrews chapter 11 did. You know how they did it. They didn't coast through life, no. But they continued or they, 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 they counted reproach for Christ greater than the treasures of Egypt. In other words, you and I have to understand, we're going to suffer. We're going to have to deal with stuff. Stuff is going to happen. Stuff, stuff like what we're going through. The corona, the pandemic. God has allowed, whether or not he's the one that sent it to us, he's allowing it. And all things work together for our good. God will take what's perhaps meant for uh, our detriment, he'll take it and use it to make us better people. Can I get a witness? The Hebrew writer says in chapter 11, verse 24, beginning at verse 24, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 25 of Hebrews chapter 11 says he chose to share, listen, the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. Verse 26, he thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking, come on, ahead to his great reward. What you and I are going through today, and I must admit, for some it's even a greater Res uh, responsibility or persecution or, 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 or a burden than others may be experiencing. But what you and I are going through today, God says you're going to get through it one way or the other, but you got to keep your eyes on him. Can I get a witness? So the main point of this passage is the one imperative. Don't miss this. It's in verse one of Hebrews 12. The main point of this text is to run. Not just run, but keep on running in this race. It's a marathon, a long distance race to the finish. Can I get a witness? Does anybody out here know that we're in a marathon? Yeah, I hear somebody say, I, I didn't know what I signed up for. Well, for one thing, you be glad that you signed up to be a part of the family of God. Because us outside the family of God, there's no way you can win. See, the Bible says, run this race set before us. Don't stroll, don't meander, don't wander about aimlessly. Run as in a race, listen, with a finish line, with everything hanging on it. Notice what you got to do in order to run a spiritually productive race. Verse 1, I'm right in the passage. It says, lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us. I don't know what it is, but every one of us has something that we wrestle with. Some sinful something, thought, word, or deed. 
from the pulpit to the door, ceiling to the floor. Every one of us, there's no one, I don't care who you are, how righteous you think you are, that doesn't have to wrestle with some kind of sin or sinful thought or pattern. Can I get a witness? The Bible says, the text lets us to know we must lay aside, not only, listen, entangling sins, but every encumbrance. That is, every weight or obstacle. Things that uh, in themselves may not be sins, but could lead to sinful actions. And notice, huh, I know we don't think too much about it, but when you continue to nitpick, yeah, that includes, we're talking about things that lead to sinful practice, nitpicking, yeah. When you quarantine this cabin fever, some of us start to nitpick. Why don't this, why this, that, or the other? It shows us that, that, that we're in a fight. This faith, this, this walk, this run, is, it has to do with maintaining our faith. It's the race of the Christian life. And it's not fought well or run well by asking. You don't have what's wrong or, 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 or what's wrong with him or her. Because this quarantine brings us out. We start questioning one another. We start looking. See, <laughs> the same person that you're questioning today is the same person that uh, was the, that way prior to the pandemic. But because we weren't spending time closed in together, either we ignored it or uh, we didn't pay it much attention. But now that we're locked in, huh, we see the worst of each other. Yeah. But what you want to find out is whatever it is that's irritating you, is it so much or so irritating that it's going to hinder your race or our purpose to please God? Amen, somebody. You don't want to ask people why they do this or that. Ask what is it that they're doing? Is it enough to keep you from doing what you're supposed to do? Yeah, 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 yeah. See, Hebrews, the, the, the uh, uh, verse one says it's a command to look at your life, think hard about what you are doing and get serious with what you will put up with and what stays or controls you and what goes. And because of this coronavirus pandemic, most of us, are forced into quarantine in our homes, listen, where irritability can cause various kinds of conflict. You don't have to look any further than yourself. Are you irritated this morning? Is there someone in your house that's irritating you? Is there some uh, habit, some, 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 something that somebody's doing or saying that's irritating you? I'm talking about irritability. Is your, your fuse, so to speak? Do you have a short fuse? Now, some of us before the uh, pandemic had a short fuse. Now, look at you now. You thought folk didn't want to, you, you couldn't stand folk or they couldn't stand you prior to. But even now, it's getting worse. And God says, don't allow the enemy to circumvent your purpose. The plan I have for you, because God says, in spite of what's going on, I can still bring the best out of you. Can I get a witness? Now, there are different reasons for irritability. Amen, somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Health and, and, and the well-being of your fam, family members, that'll cause irritability. Yes, it will. There, there, or, or there's a spiritual or biblical response to irritability. In other words, what I'm asking, how do you deal with it? I'm talking about irritability. It's going to help somebody today if you not only acknowledge you're irritated. See, some of us, uh, we don't think it's spiritual to, to acknowledge that we're irritated. But sometimes we just get on, for lack of a better word, each other's nerves. You got anybody? Don't look at them. Don't mention that. But is there anybody in your house today that gets on your nerves? Yeah, be honest. But guess what? You may be getting on that other person's nerves <laughs> as much as they're getting on yours. Now, what do we do as believers? Do we blow up? Do we explode with sinful anger? No, we don't want to, you don't want to allow irritability to have its way in your house. No, you don't. And ir irritation, it overflows, I tell you, it spills out to everybody else. You want to know why your children aren't happy. You want to know why no, everybody's in their own room because they know every time you come together, there's an explosion of anger and frustration. We got to know how to deal with that. 
The Proverbs uh, writer says in Proverbs 15, 1, it says, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words, listen, make tempers flare. We got to learn how to talk to each other. And if I'm not going to be able to talk to say the right thing, or if I know what I say is going to cause uh, irritability or, or sinful response, then I need to keep my mouth closed. Amen, somebody. Now, if it's not, the shoe don't fit, so to speak, don't you wear it. But we want to understand that irritability, if it's not docked, and if it's not confronted or dealt with better, is the word, dealt with properly, biblically, we'll become sinful and we'll find ourselves allowing rather than growing as a result of this crisis when it's over and it will be over sooner or later. We'll find ourselves distancing once we're out of the quarantine. You don't want to do that. God wants us to get together so that when this thing is over, we'll be stronger in our faith, we'll be more responsive to our loved ones, and we'll show everybody that our focus was not on our thoughts, but our focus was on our faith in Christ. Can I get a witness? Somebody asked that, can, does God get irritated? Well, God doesn't get irritated, no, but God does get angry. And his anger is not because he just got irritated. No. See, see, irritation, the irritation that, that you and I experience is, is spontaneous, something quick. And God gets angry over a period of time for those things that we persist on doing that he's already let us to know is the wrong thing to do. The Bible says that love is not irritable. First Corinthians chapter three, 13, verse four says love is patient. In your home right now, maybe God is teaching you or trying to teach you and I how to be patient. We say we love one another, and that was easier said than done when we weren't, uh, didn't have to be so close to each other for such an extended period of time. But now God says, you say you love, I'm going to show you what love does. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love, biblical love, does not demand its own way. Verse 5 says, it's not, there's that word irritable, it's in the Bible. And it keeps no record of being wrong. Are you guilty of keeping records of somebody that wronged you today? If you are, shame on you. Supposing God were to keep a record of how you and I wrong him or do the wrong things or disobedient. We'd be all be in trouble. If God doesn't keep a record, why are you keeping a record of what wrong somebody did to you? And God says, I give you a new set of mercies each and every day. Understand here, we need to press this a bit because the Greek word that Paul uses here, paroxuzo, paroxuzo, is translated as irritable. It can also be translated as provoked, kindled, or incited. Now, that word is the same Greek word that the Greek Old Testament uses in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 25, when the prophet said that God was provoked or kindled to anger by Israel. In other words, somebody asked the question, if love agape is not provoked, according to 1 Corinthians 13 and 5, and God is love, agape love, according to 1 John 4 and 8, how can it be okay for God to be provoked to anger? I'm glad you asked. The answer is this. The answer is that being provoked to anger in general isn't the issue Paul is addressing. Paul knew there were reasons for biblical, listen, provocation, being provoked. Reasons that were just, righteous, loving, and therefore necessary reasons to be provoked to anger. And none of them were quick or hasty responses. God doesn't get or act upon us quickly or hastily. It's over a long period of time. If God, I don't know who out there could put up. I don't, I know I couldn't put up with me like God puts up with me. Put your name in there. I'm talking about people becoming too quickly or too easily provoked to anger. We need to understand when God gets angry, he takes a slow time to get there. Amen, somebody. You and I don't need to allow every time somebody says a wrong word, every time somebody does a wrong thing or something you don't like, that we're snapping and we're quick to, to, because we're spending too much time. Find yourself a corner 
Find yourself a closet. Find yourself a sacred place. Have a little talk with Jesus. Am I right about it? Before you even allow yourself to, to, to smother or fester or allow whatever it is that's irritating you to get you to the point that now you lash it out. Understand that none of us is promised tomorrow. Can I get a witness? Being irritated and allowing irritation to take over is really selfishness. You don't want to allow irritability to expose your selfishness. Selfishness is everything about you and not so much about somebody else. But I'm so glad that God was never selfish. He never was and never is. He puts you and I in the forefront. In other words, when Jesus paid the penalty for your sins and mine, he died. He did what needed to be done in spite of us. He didn't allow, come on now, while I was yet a sinner, the Bible says, Romans 5 and 8. Christ died. While I was still, he didn't allow himself to be irritated by my uh, disobedience and continued disobedience to circumvent his purpose. No, he thought about you and I. And I'm trying to hasten to a close, if you will. There's never really a right time for irritability. And there's one word that comes to mind as it refers to irritability. As I get ready to close, the Bible teaches us. God wants us to know to stop being irritated. You can stop allowing irritability to control you. Y'all looking at me funny. How can I stop? Well, you perhaps have done that earlier today. You were irritated until you got a phone call. I mean, you were fussing, you were mussing, you were doing all of the things. Everything with everybody and whoever he or she was would get you on your last nerve until the phone rang. You picked it up and you said, oh, praise the Lord. How's everything? You, you stopped. You put your anger, you allowed, you, you suppressed your irritability. And you took control. And God says, you can do that with another human person. Why don't you allow my spirit? Keep that on call. That'll keep you from being so irritated with somebody else. Stop, it says. And that's an acronym I want to use for the word stop. S-T-O-P. The S is for stop, repent, and ask. We got a purpose to stop sooner than later when we are irritated and begin to despair and doubt God. We got to stop just like we can stop when somebody else comes into the house or to the room and we don't want them to know our business. Didn't I tell you before that God can see a black ant on a black rock at midnight? That means God already knows our business. We've got to practice his presence. Can I get a witness? Not only the S for stop, but there's the T for trust. Trust the promises of God. Promises that are found, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, says God will generously provide all you and I need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. You know the verses. Philippians 4, 19 says, And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs. I know you're frustrated. I know it gets to you. I know you want to be able to go out and shop and do this, that, and the other. But wait on the Lord, somebody says. God knows and God will take care. You say, I don't have the means to be taken care. Trust God, somebody. Not only the S and the T in the word stop, but there's the letter O for obey. Remember that your emotions are gauges, not God's. Don't let irritation reign in your life. The Bible says in Romans 6 and 12, do not let sin control the way you live. Can I get a witness? It says, do not give in to sinful desires. Notice as you and I obey and I repeat again from 1 Corinthians 13, it says love is patient. You say you can't be as more patient. No, you've got to get out of the way. Allow God by his spirit to control you. 
Love is patient and kind. Verse 5 said, real biblical love is not irritable. It's not easily irritated. You've got to practice love. You've got to allow the God who is love to take control. See, love obeys. Can I get a witness? That's what John 14 verse 15 says. Not only the S and the T and the letter O for obey, but lastly, there's the letter P in the spelling of the word for stop. And that P equals plan. You have to have a plan. Can I get a witness? What about you over there and you over there? What about you there? How about in the other room? Do you have a plan so that you won't allow irritability to jump you and to arrest you and to uh, 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 jump on you all of a sudden? You don't want to be bull rushed. You don't want to be ambushed by irritability. What is your plan to avoid irritability in your house? You mean you don't have a plan? Well, after the day, you ought to have a plan. You need to exercise spiritual discipline. That's what the Bible talks about. And how do you avoid the temptations and entertain irritability? Not to entertain irritability. You got to ask yourself, when am I frequently irritable? You know, there's some setups when you get in a certain conversation, when you uh, do a certain thing. So you've got a purpose in your mind not to allow the certain conversation or the certain body language. You've got to do something ahead of time so that you won't react, but you'll respond to the Holy Spirit. You've got to pursue the escape from temptation offered by the Lord. I'm closing, but 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. I know you think you're the only one going through. I know you think you're the only one having problems. But you need to know God is faithful. All I'm saying is that you have to take advantage of the grace of planning. Don't be discouraged. Don't allow discouragement and irritability to take control. The God that brought you this far is the same God that's going to take you down the road until the finish. You don't want to start and not finish this race. Run and understand the Bible says I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I'm talking about you got to have a plan. You've got to make sure that you're doing it God's way and not allowing your sinful propensity, my propensity to sin, to get in the way. I like the songwriter that said, down the road when we finish this race, it says, I shall wear a crown. I like the lyrics that says, when it's all over, aren't you glad somebody to know sooner or later it's going to be all over? It says, I'm going to put on my robe and tell the story how I made it over. Is anybody here willing to tell a story? You're developing a story. I don't know what your story is, but my story is that I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. I was very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more, but but the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry. And from the waters, he lifted me. Now safe, safe, safe am I. I'm talking about our response to irritability. Our response to quarantine or cabin fever. You know what you do? You praise him in spite of. Instead of thinking about what's wrong. Thank God for what's right. You got a roof over your head is a worthy of praise. You got a right mind, it's time to praise him. You got arms to hold up. <laughs> you got ears to hear. You got food on the table. You got loved ones still around. It's time to praise him. Praise is therapeutic. Praise is where we get our help. I hope. God bless you. Now listen, those of you that have allowed or acknowledged irritability has set in as a result of this quarantine or cabin fever. The Bible says acknowledge, confess, 
Let God knows what he already knows. You're succumbing to the pressures of life and your circumstances. Jesus said, you can place all of that burden on him. His burden is light. He put a yoke on you that you can handle. Somebody in here, you're not able to deal with your irritability if you don't have the God who's speaking about irritability even now. Because irritability goes into sinful patterns and sin altogether. And we need to understand, we need a God to place our trust in that has died for your sins and mine. The Bible lets us to know that everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you're here today, this morning, and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is your time. Just repeat after me, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. This irritability, this quarantine, this, 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 this cabin fever is overwhelming me. I don't know what to do. Well, turn it over to Jesus. Acknowledge, first of all, you need him as your savior. He not only saves you from the penalty of sin, he saves you from sinful propensity and tendencies when they come and when we're confronted with them. Give your life to Christ. And if you've asked Jesus Christ to save you today, he'll save you not only for eternal purposes to be with him, but to save you from being overwhelmed by life circumstances. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. Peace. Amen. To our ABC Church family and friends, we truly hope this message has been a blessing to you and your family. We look forward to sharing God's word with you again in the near future. Because of the coronavirus, we're not able to gather together in one local assembly, but audio and video technology allows us to come together. To God be the glory. You know we support our church and its ministries by our giving through tithes and love offerings support for me, your pastor. To give, please click on the links below. Again, please stay encouraged. Remember Psalms 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in our time of trouble. God bless you. Thank you.